On July 24, 1987, 11-year-old Derek Pickering had spent the day like so many others with his best friend, Charles Galloway. Late that afternoon, Charles' parents, Bob and Karen, were getting ready for a special evening out. It was a Friday evening about uh, 6, 15, 6, 30, and uh, well, Charles and, and Derek had been over at our house playing. Charles' parents were just about to leave for dinner. This was a very special day for us because it was our 16th wedding anniversary and our daughter's 15th birthday. Derek and Charles were going to go over to Derek's house. The weather wasn't real great and they wanted to take Derek's dog home. Charles and Derek had been friends for a number of years, built tree houses in the vacant lot and climbed on the neighbor's roofs. Uh, they'd done a lot of things together. When the boys arrived at Derek Pickering's house, his parents were out, and only his 13-year-old sister, Sean, was home. I mean, uh, he's just a tiny little bad little brother, but he really is special to me. Mom says I should stay in. It looks like it's going to rain. And, of course, he never listens to anything I say, so he went straight back out. So I said, oh, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to ignore him. try to play jokes on me and I figured it was just another joke and it wasn't funny it was really scaring me it was Sean Hello. and she said Charles and Derek are lying out there and they won't talk to me those were her exact words I don't know but I've been yelling and I'm really scared well, the okay, boys had been known to pull pranks on Sean and the weather had not been that bad and so we were not really even in a terrific hurry as we drove up, you know, they weren't moving, and I really jumped out of the car before she even stopped. I knew it was serious. Karen knew it was serious. All I noticed was that they weren't breathing. It was the most horrifying thing. You'd like to fall down and cry. Well, I was panicking like crazy, but I knew I couldn't. Is he breathing yet, Karen? No! No! Help Charles! He's not breathing yet. There wasn't any affirmative response from either one of them to our CPR. I felt like I was doing it right, but it was, you know, something I had not done in 20 years. Sean came out, and I called her and said, Sean, call 911 and give them the address. Sean's call came in at 6.34 p.m. The call was passed to dispatcher Ann Ford. A respiratory therapist who lived nearby rushed over to help. A Gulfport rescue unit immediately responded, but they had no idea how serious the situation was. En route, we were thinking, well, maybe a kid was plugging in the TV or something and just got a little shot. I just felt like it was all my fault. If I would have made him stay in the house, then none of this would have happened. It had been nearly four minutes since the boys were struck by lightning. When paramedic Richard Chapman and his partner got to the scene, Charles and Derek were still not breathing. It was two minute response time. On our arrival, we pulled up and there was not one but two children. And it was more or less a, a nightmare. I've been to mass casualty incidents and nothing had ever 
prepared me to see two small children lying there basically dead. You could see uh, burns to their neck area. You could smell the singed hair. It was uh, a smell you never forget. I had this terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach. The one boy had a heartbeat but was not breathing on his own. The other boy was clinically dead in the sense that he didn't have a heartbeat and he was not breathing. I was just holding on to Karen, and I guess that was the first time I had maybe allowed myself to think that he might not live. I was thinking, this is not happening to me on my anniversary and my daughter's birthday. Okay, we have folks over here. Okay, hyperventilating. Uh, shortly after intubating them, the second boy developed a heartbeat, so now we had two children in respiratory arrest. Rescue Ken headquarters, send me an engine company. I saw them like taping stuff to Derek and giving him shots and stuff. And when I thought about him dying and you know not having anyone to fight with anymore or to call names, I started crying. Six minutes after the call for help, additional life support units arrive, including paramedic supervisor Mike Stanton. I saw that the fire department paramedics were treating these kids very aggressively, and I knew at that point that they had some pretty severe injuries. You're always very afraid of this type of situation. Uh, any type of electrical injury can cause a severe muscle contraction, and they got a significant voltage uh, put to them that caused their heart to stop. To prevent overloading one emergency room, Derek and Charles were transported to separate hospitals. Both boys were in critical condition, but Charles continued to deteriorate. In route to the hospital, he began to posture, which is usually a sign of some significant brain injury. In my past experience, that's not a good sign. And when I turned the boy over to the hospital staff, I didn't have much hope for him. Charles was admitted to Gulf Coast Community Hospital, where pediatrician Don Legron was on call. Uh, with lightning, we're talking, with a direct hit, we're talking about millions of volts of electricity that may last for up to a second. The, the higher, more important surface parts of his brain were completely out of order. Uh, and that's really scary. When we see that, it's usually a prelude to death. His pupils were not responsive to light. They would fluctuate in their size, independent of one another. And the primary thing was stabilizing and supporting his vital functions. At nearby Memorial Hospital, Derek's condition had stabilized under the care of Dr. Ronald Bruni. I suspect that Derek's burns were due mainly to a splash effect. Sitting next to his friend, who was directly struck by the lightning, his eardrum was, was ruptured. And it was probably from this loud clap of thunder being right close to him. He didn't respond appropriately to painful stimuli. His blood pressure was elevated. And yet, after a few hours, he began to uh, recover. And after 12 hours, he was able to converse with people. He, he, was, he was still, you know, a little weak. And I knew I couldn't beat him up yet. But the half his part was when he came home. But Charles was still in a deep coma. We, we didn't know then if he was going to live or not. And then they took us in to see him. He looked awful. <laughs> was full of tubes and his hair was all burned. It was very frightening. <laughs> I knew that he could die or have brain damage, but I honestly never believed that that was going to happen. And I guess that's a self-protective device because, that, you know, I don't know how I would have held up had I really believed that. Charles' parents took turns staying by his bedside. After 30 hours, his mother finally noticed a change. He opened his eyes, and truly, it might have been two seconds, but it was a great lift to my spirit. Three years later, Charles has fully recovered. He still has no memory of the incident, but it has changed his life. My relationship with my family and parents became, I believe, a lot closer, because I, because after all that I'd heard about all the stories and all the things they had done for me, I realized that how much they really cared for me. 
It used to really burn me up when Charles would wear his cleats in the house and leave mud and, and clay all over the floor. And now we just clean it up, and we're glad that there's somebody there to leave the clay there. Charles' mother Karen gave him and Derek each a lightning charm as a symbol of the bond between them. This lightning charm was to remind us of our friendship, to show us like what we've been through together, and that we shouldn't separate because we share like a special thing together that, that hasn't happened around here. We'll be friends for life.